Behaviorally, um, and uh, and they and the big holding was just because something is prohibited to claim for a drug does not mean that it's prohibited to claim for a supplement if it is a structure function claim. Um, we also have some health claims under NLEA, uh, the uh, Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, that apply to our products: calcium and osteoporosis. Folic acid, newer, neural tube defect, and uh, scanosteroids uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. And those are important products uh, in the industry. Um, the benefits of these kinds of regulation is it, it establish the parameters for people to operate under. Uh, it does require that the laws or that the claims be substantiated, which is something that FDA does not really enforce. But it is something that is now, in the last, say, four years, being enforced by consumer uh, plaintiff's lawyers suing on behalf of consumers in states where there are consumer protection laws that allow those states. That has become a big issue uh, in the industry. Um, and I hope if you're listening to me here, you're saying, what about us? Because that's why we're uh, uh, bringing you this uh, information. Uh, we had a botanical that was a huge seller even before Deshay passed. It was used for weight loss products. It's ephedra. It's a very good herb. It is the herb that gave you the drug. Ephedra, pseudoephedrine, uh, and, and other drugs of that nature. Uh, because what the pharmaceutical did, companies did is they first marketed these as botanical drugs. And you can find that in the old U.S. pharmacopoeias. But what they wanted was consistency. They always wanted the same product. And uh, a chemistry set gets you there. And so they created the drug forms, uh, the synthetic organic chemistry forms of these various uh, uh, plant parts. Um, we met with FDA repeatedly. The industry did. We tried. We went to advisory committee meetings. Uh, we, we had expert uh, uh, physicians. Uh, uh, doing testimony for us. Uh, we thought we could reach an accord with FDA, uh, but we were not able to. There was no consensus, and so FDA banned uh, ephedra from dietary supplements uh, in uh, 2003 after a very long uh, rulemaking. What do we have? What lessons? Uh, botanicals are psychological errors physiologically active, uh, just like uh, drugs. Uh, no wonder you get a little kick if you take an ephedrine uh, or ephedra uh, weight loss product. That's why they sold. You could feel you were taking something. You don't feel vitamins and minerals usually. Uh, the failure uh, of the industry to reach agreement uh, led to the rulemaking ban, uh, and many, many companies made tons of money in this business. And then they lost tons of money, and most went bankrupt uh, after product liability suits alleging injury uh, bankrupted uh, the companies. Um, there was one other case that, that is important. Uh, there was a case uh, regarding red yeast rice. Red yeast rice was a product uh, formulated by uh, at least one company very carefully. They patented it. They said it was new. It was different. And it was a drug, it was a, a uh, supplement ingredient that was designed to deliver lovastatin uh, in a way that would help lower cholesterol. Well, the problem was Merck had a drug, Metacor, that contains lovastatin, and they were promoting this red yeast rice at half the dosage of lovastatin uh, and or Merck's Metacor. And there's a provision in the Dietary Supplement Act that says you cannot have a dietary supplement where there's an approved drug in the category. So uh, that uh, red yeast rice uh, came off the market in that driven form, formulated uh, to uh, control the amount of, um, of lovastatin. Uh, lesson, uh, there are, as I understand it, there are ingredients being uh, research for uh, epilepsy in children. And there are drugs being researched with those same ingredients, epilepsy for children. Consider that there may be two locomotives going uh, towards each other 
in that context. Uh, that's what happened uh, with Lovastatin and Metabor. CDMPs for dietary supplements, that was in the original uh, statute. FDA was empowered to create these regulations. The industry early on, I think in 1997, petitioned FDA for those kinds of regulations, but it was a long time before FDA got around uh, to doing it uh, or to promulgating those regulations. They are extraordinarily detailed. They take up many, many, many more pages in the Code of Federal Regulations than the comparable regulations for prescription drugs or any kind of drugs. Uh, they are extraordinarily detailed, and FDA is now using those uh, CGMPs, especially with respect to uh, uh, botanicals, uh, to enforce against the botanical industry and other companies uh, within in the industry, uh, because they can really get down into the manufacturing processes of, of the uh, companies. Uh, the burdens on botanical manufacturers are significant. But think about it in your context. Ingredient uh, identification. Is it cannabis or is it grass clippings? Uh, that's important for your customers. It's important for your business. Microbial adulterants. Plants carry microbes. Microbes carry disease in some cases. Uh, sanitation in the facility. Composition of the finished product. <coughs> Record keeping to assure that everything was done to keep the product within in boundaries. All of those are very, very important items that you all need to think about going forward. Um, we also had, in 2003, the American Herbal Products Association proposed uh, regulations uh, to establish serious adverse event reporting uh, for dietary supplements. Because pharmacovigilance, knowing what's happening in the patient population out there, is very important to tracking uh, uh, the use of items, especially the use of products in sick people. And we're talking medical marijuana in here. It's very critical. Um, Jane will talk about the law that was passed. Eventually, Congress agreed and passed the law requiring adverse event reporting. Um, here are some issues that you all, I think, are going to confront that the dietary supplement industry is currently confronting. Supplements for animals. We don't, there are no supplement category for animals. Yet, if you go into a pet smart or other place, you'll see a huge amount of products in this category. Conventional food forms, bars and drinks. Is it a supplement or is it a, um, is it a food? And with, with respect to what you all do, when you put it in a food, what happens? We have laws on that subject. Um, combinations of dietary supplements and OTC drugs, something that's never been allowed, but I wouldn't be surprised to see people trying to put combinations of cannabis products uh, with OTC drugs. Warning labels and precautions. Oh my goodness. You really are supposed to tell the doctor and the doctor is supposed to evaluate whether or not the product is safe for the patient. You do that through warnings, precautions, and other information. Very, very important. Is it safe for use in children and pregnancy? Is it safe for use in mom, nursing moms? All of these are important questions. So be careful out there. Your products have to be safe. Don't test your new and improved products in your customers. That is not something we really do in an advanced country like the United States of America. You shouldn't be doing it. Safe and truthfully labeled products will keep the plaintiff's lawyers and the plaintiffs from smoking you because that's what they will do when they see how much money is out there on the table. When the state of Colorado publishes how much tax money they are getting from this industry, you can be sure that there are plaintiff's lawyers looking, uh, looking at that and saying, how can I take some of that money and put it into my client's pockets if they've been <coughs> injured out there? So you have your state governments, you have your federal government, but remember, there is the no government uh, lawyer bar, that can be a big problem for your industry. Thank you.